Welcome to the 238th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, I speak with multi-talented poet and teacher, Taylor Mali. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live, Twitch, and Periscope. And you can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. And please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, March 11th, 2021, there are 2,625,396 deaths globally from COVID-19. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. In the United States, there are 530,423 deaths from COVID-19, and in Japan, the death toll from COVID-19 is 8,412. I want to once again note March 11th as the 10th anniversary of the Great East Japan Earthquake, Tsunami, and Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, and I hope You'll spend some time today, I know most people have, thinking about that event, and if you have time, you could listen to the memorial episode that I was honored to do earlier this week, episode number 235, with my guests Ryuma Shineha, Kota, Juroku, Sofakar Amir, and Kyoko Sato. It was really... Um, insightful conversation with those scholars, and it was also good to be among friends, and I hope you've been among friends today. As a way to bring some humanity to the COVID numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way, and I'd like to continue that now. Headline is Raja Mukhopadhyay, poetry-loving police officer dies at 50. The author is Shalini Vinogopal Bhagat, and this appeared December 2nd, 2020 in the New York Times. By day, he was a senior officer in charge of telecommunications for his district police department. By night, Raja Mukhopadhyay communicated in another medium, verse. Mr. Mukhopadhyay was an accomplished poet, the author of some 2,000 poems in Bengali, and a well-known figure in local literary circles in the Indian state of West Bengal. Poetry was his true passion, his brother Dubasi said. He even started a school in his hometown to teach students the finer points of poetry recitation. Mr. Mukhopadhyay inherited his love of Bengali literature from his mother and started writing poetry as a teenager. Several, several of his poems were published in magazines and online, and his work had many admirers on social media. Mr. Mukhopadhyay tested positive for the coronavirus on October 5th, shortly after attending a conference. He decided to go to a hospital in Calcutta to protect his family rather than quarantine at home. He developed breathing difficulties and died of COVID-19 on November 5th, his brother said. He was 50. Mr. Mukhopadhyay was born on December 18, 1969 in Salda, a small village in West Bengal. His father, Mritunjoy Mukhopadhyay, was a government employee, and Sudo Mukhopadhyay, his mother, was a homemaker. He was the youngest of three children. The family's circumstances were modest. The children walked two miles to school, and electricity arrived in the area only when they were in their teens, but he recalled their childhood happy. Mr. Mukhopadhyay attended Kalapur College, where he earned a degree in chemistry in 1990. He tutored local children in the subject while on the police force. Despite his degree, he became fascinated by wireless radio technology and Morse code and decided to learn more about it. He joined a district police force in West Bengal in 1995 and was assigned to the telecommunications department. 
He married Mitali Chatterjee in 2000 in a traditional arranged marriage. The couple shared a love of Bengali literature and poetry, and they hosted many literary soirees at their home over the years. Along with his brother, Mr. Mukhopadhyay is survived by his wife, his sons, Oish and Sharanya, his parents, and a sister, Bulbul. Many of his poems had romantic or political themes. This one was untitled. This is one of Mr. Mukhopadhyay's poems. When going for a swim in the sea, you call me. I will keep my eyes on the storm. Allow me to hold both your hands. Let our words go breaking the barrier beyond all calculations. Let the sun rise with a new dawn and the fairy weather all the storm. When going for a swim, call me once. Remove all the darkness of mind and allow me to hold both your hands. I'd like to turn to my conversation today, one I've really been looking forward to. Let me introduce my guest. Taylor Molly is one of the most well-known poets to have emerged from the Poetry Slam movement. He was one of the original poets to appear on the HBO series Russell Simmons Presents Deaf Poetry and was cast as the Armani-clad villain of Paul Devlin's 1997 documentary film Slam Nation. His poem, What Teachers Make, has been viewed over more, four million times on YouTube and was quoted by the New York Times' Thomas Friedman in one of his commencement addresses. Ali is a vocal advocate of teachers and the nobility of teaching, having spent nine years in the classroom teaching everything from English and history to math and SAT test preparation. He's performed and lectured for teachers all over the world. And in 2012, he reached his goal of creating 1,000 new teachers through poetry, persuasion, and perseverance. Based on the poem that inspired a movement, his book of essays, What Teachers Make and Praise of the Greatest Job in the World is his passionate defense of teachers, drawing on his own experiences both in the classroom and as a traveling poet. He's the author of four books of poetry, Late Father and Other Poems, Bouquet of Red Flags, The Last Time As We Were, and What Learning Leaves. I am really honored to bring Taylor Molly to COVID Calls. Taylor, thanks for your time today. Professor Knowles, such an honor to be here. And uh, thank you for reading that obituary of Officer Mukupadye. Uh, sounds like he would have been uh, my brother, despite being five years younger than me. Uh, COVID, COVID spares no one. It's really something. I was glad to come across that obituary. And it's been one of the things, I don't know if you read obituaries um, regularly. I do one every day on the, on the program. But so many people have significant talents in many spaces in their lives that's not their job job and we're discovering that maybe some people are aware of that all the time but you know mr mukopadye is just yet another example of a person he had a uniform on to do one thing but you imagine him at his post composing and it's just such a stirring stirring yeah. image if he was like me he tra he he walks around uh you know sort of jumbling words together, uh, carrying it like, like loose change. And there, there might have been a time doing his doing his job, pulling somebody over, giving them a ticket that he thinks, oh, wait, wait, I got to, I have to, I have to find a piece of paper. I also loved what you said that he started a school to teach students the finer points of poetry recitation. That's before the pandemic hit. That was basically, you know, 60% of my income was traveling around the world teaching poetry mm. workshops. And all of my poetry workshops, regardless of what they say on the syllabus, always end up being about how to perform your poem because the mm. skills involved to, in writing a poem are not, don't overlap entirely with the skills in presenting a poem. And, you know, the first the, the first three lessons of, of poetry recitation are a little slower, a lot louder and a lot clearer. And nobody, nobody, nobody is gonna say, you know what, you were you read too slowly and too clearly. So I suspect <laughs> he was there telling the kids in India who were standing back there going, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which which is interesting when you say that because it's also a way of I, I guess of telling people to be confident and proud in your 
in your ideas, which seems like something, you know, I, I liked that detail as well. And that made me think it, it goes beyond just teaching recitation. It's also a sort of coaching people and finding their voice and their confidence. That's something that you're expert in as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. I don't know about whether I'm an expert, but uh, I, I do have a, one of my one of my more well-known poems besides what teachers make is, is a poem called totally like whatever. And it mocks, I wrote it mocking our generation for those people who, who make even the most declarative sentences sound like they're interrogative. <laughs> but, uh, and, and you know, it, the poem exhorts people to find their voice, find their confidence, work on how they speak to, at least sound like they themselves believe in 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 what they're in what they're saying which is much much the same work as as when you are teaching them how to write let us you know what do you what do you believe let's put it down there although um auden auden said that poetry is a the the clear explanation of mixed feelings which mm -hmm. I love. It's not mm -hmm. the, but, but you see, I, and I feel like too often young people, especially in this day and age where you, if you say the wrong thing, you can, you can be excoriated by the cool kids, you know, online. Uh, so it's safer. It seems to be safer these days instead of what Auden said, the clear explanation of mixed feelings people would rather sort of do the mixed explanations. You know, nobody really knows what I'm, what I'm talking about. I don't really believe what I'm saying. So you can't quote me and cause you don't, I don't really believe this, whatever, what, you know, it's just, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. don't get me talking about that. And that performance is online on YouTube and, it, and it's a great, it's a great piece. And also the, the way you perform it is, is uh, again, you capture that, that, strange verbal tick that we have, right? Like needing that affirmation at the end of every, everything. Well, that, I think, that I think you as an interviewer might have another excuse for making things sound like questions. Although you're, it's because one of the people that's most guilty of it is Terry Gross from Fresh Air, WHYY. That was probably your local uh, public radio station mm -hmm. until, until you moved to Korea. Right. But she will often, it's on radio, and when she's talking to people, she wants everything she says to be an invitation. No, please, join, you know. Right. I right. could say, now, Scott, you, until recently, were teaching in Philadelphia, you know, which is a, right. a, a, a call for the affirmation, is what you were saying. But it's also, right. as an interviewer, you're... You want you want to give me opportunities to jump in, all of your guests. Anyway, but don't do that. <laughs> Is it right? Exactly. And but even you describing that that Auden Auden sense of of what poetry was, I've been thinking a lot over this last year about Tony Fauci as a communicator and other public health communicators. And one of the challenges they've faced is related to what you just described, which is that they, they, they have to get up in front of people and, and describe uncertainty. And, and they have to actually describe their certainty about the uncertainty, uh, which is to say, as a scientist, as a physician, I'm here to tell you that we're learning a lot every day and we're gonna keep you updated. And following the kind of language that he uses, I'm not gonna call him a poet, I'm not gonna not call him a poet. I'm gonna say that I would love to read Tony Fauci's poetry when he writes it because I think he's quite good at capturing that sense that he's not certain that what he can describe to you is 100% the case and lives and deaths are on the line, but he's going to bring it to you anyway. And I really, I like the way he communicates. You know, I was listening to, years ago, I was at a graduation address and there was a columnist and I wish I could remember what her name was. But this was when the show Crossfire was still on the air. And where somebody from the left and somebody from the right, two people from the right and two people from the left just yell at each other for an hour. It was horrible. And Jon Stewart put a drove a nail in their in their coffin. And she said that she would periodically get a producer calling her up to sort of probe how she believed, what she believed. And she said the the way to not get on that show is to say, well, 
there are good arguments on both sides and it I, there's a lot that we don't know and the the the, the, the producers yeah. was like no we want people who really only believe that their side is right yeah, and is are right. not willing to admit that there's a lot we don't know I want to remind everyone you're listening to COVID calls and I'm talking to poet and educator Taylor Molly today. Taylor, let me um, ask you just a little housekeeping here. Where are you calling from today and what's the pandemic looking like there? I'm calling from Brooklyn, New York, where we're coming out of a very cold spell. Today was gorgeous, might have even gotten up into 70 degrees and it things feel like they're it's wonderful to walk around. I got 7,000 steps, 7,500 steps today, which I haven't gotten in, in, in weeks. Um, I'm, I'm looking out the window and I'm seeing a woman walking without a mask, but that's the first one I've seen in a year. This is Brooklyn, uh, this part of Brooklyn, uh, probably all of New York is, is very uh, mask conscious. Um, my wife w volunteers at a Jewish funeral home, and so she sits shiva with with dead bodies, and that uh, that got her on the list of of um, of get, being uh, eligible for the vaccine. So she's gotten her second shot, and she said to me, uh, "Listen, I love you, but when my parents come in April, the three of us are going out to dinner, and uh, I'll bring you I'll bring you some leftovers." But you know, we haven't been out to dinner in over a year, and uh, it's, you know, it's, we're surviving. Uh, at least my, my family is surviving. Brooklyn is doing well, um, but it's, uh, it's getting old. Absolutely. Uh, and it's been just, you know, that, that vaccine, that expectation, uh, the Times had a piece that showed what people in different states could expect based on their age and on their occupation. And it's an absolutely confusing array um, of rationales for who should get vaccinated and at what pace. I wonder if, if you've shared those conversations with family and friends. Have you, you know, I've had those. Have you had it yet? No. When will you get it? How? Where? So many unknowns. <clears throat> the, uh, the older generation has, has um, by and large, all, all had their second shot. Um, I, I've had a couple of uh, uh, offers to uh, like to jump the line um, mm. in a in a you know very underhanded way, and I've got some some family members who have have you know cut cut a few corners uh, and and uh, and gotten gotten vaccinated. But um, I just signed up for a, a place uh, at a pharmacy up on Atlantic Avenue where they're giving away um, not giving away, but they left over leftover doses that they have at the end of the day, they'll text you and say, if you can get here in 15 minutes, we got a shot for you. I see. Um, but I'm, but I, I, I'm wondering uh, whether I still have to be eligible when I get there uh, or whether it's a, like no questions asked, these are going to go to waste if we don't give them to somebody today. Somehow I think that experience of dashing down the street with the clock ticking is going to become the basis of a poem for you at some at some point, I, I it, might. <laughs> it might. It might. Um, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about teaching. Oh, in fact, Actually, I have to go. Yeah. Just me. <laughs> <laughs> no, keep the keep it rolling. Just take it with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be a very exciting COVID call. Um, I want to. I I don't want to talk a little. Actually, I want to talk a lot about teaching with you. Uh, I grew up in a house of in a family of teachers in a house where teaching was. Uh, sacred, although my mom would kind of blanch if I describe it in that way. But she was one of these teachers who was up late at night revising her preparations for classes that she taught a dozen times already. She just took it as her life's work. Um, and I wonder if you grew up around teaching or what it was that that gave you that sense not only of teaching as a as something you wanted to do, but as an honorable craft and actually something that must be defended because you're, you're passionate not only about pedagogy, but also about defending teachers, which is cool, but doesn't come from nowhere, I don't think. You know, I didn't, I, I, was, I was pulled into teaching. Um, I, I never thought I wanted to be a teacher. I, 
I went to graduate school for poetry. My father was a poet. He used to write occasional poems. That's an actual poetic term, sort of rhyming Dr. Seuss meets Robert Frost. Um, you know, he would, at, 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 uh, at family functions, he would get up and, you know, which in my family, in a wasp family, clinking a glass means that somebody's going to make a speech. I understand in other parts of the country, clinking the glass means that you want the bride and the groom to kiss. Um, that's a, that's uh, territorial. That's not the word I mean. Uh, different parts of the country believe uh -huh, differently. Uh -huh. right? um, so I went to graduate school to become a better poet, but part of the terms of how I got my scholarship, I guess, is that I had to teach freshman composition. Um, and uh, I found that, you know, when I got together with my fellow grad students at, at the end of the day, you know, they all wanted to talk about the poems that they were writing. And I wanted to talk about the the, the grading, the rubrics that we were using to grading the assignments. Uh, what, 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 what tip can you give a kid in the assignment sheet that is going to make him or her write a better essay for you? Um, and then, and then I grad, uh, with my master's degree in, in English literature and creative writing, I went off to teach uh, middle school and high school and just fell in love with it. Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, I wrote What Teachers Make. It's now been 22 years. I wrote it uh, based on a New Year's Eve party that I went to where I was the only teacher there. And the mm -hmm. the lawyer, the, you know, anybody who wants to can can very easily go find What Teachers Make on YouTube. But the, the premise is that a, a, a lawyer asks me, you know, his, his, his thesis is that anyone who is dumb enough to want to become a teacher shouldn't be allowed to be one. And uh, in the poem, he says, come on, Taylor, be honest. What do you make? And then, I, and then the poem says, you want to know what I make? I'll tell you what I make. I make kids work harder than they ever thought they could. And, and I flip those words. And that ends with, you know, teachers make a goddamn difference. Now, what about you? Um, I don't think he actually, that is based on a real conversation. I don't think he said, what do you make? I think that is me in the next week writing the poem saying, "How? what can I pretend he said that I can then pretend that I was so smart and witty and, you know, spun his words against him. But I do remember him saying, uh, you know, Taylor, I don't want to, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but do you really feel your talents are being used to their, to their best you know, are you putting your talent to its best use by being a teacher? I mean, honestly, what what are you what are you bringing in annually? And uh, I, I like to tell people that when I recite what teachers make, uh, because uh, because the truth be told, in the in the in the passion of the moment, I was not smart enough to to. Uh, to, to put him in his place. And I just looked down at my shoes and t said something like $28,500. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, but you know, you know, the, the French have an expression, uh, l'esprit d'escalier, which is the wit of the staircase, which describes the comeback right. that occurs to you as you're walking <laughs> down the stair. And I feel like um, what teachers make is an example of, of poésie, poésie d'escalier. Like this is the poem that I wish I had been smart enough to, to write. I think uh, people can really relate to that, and, uh, I, I'm sure. And uh, thanks for that background about the poem. I put a link up here. People can find it easily on, on YouTube. Uh, and then there's a lot of writing about the poem and about your delivery of it, which, as you said earlier, it's one thing um, to read it in text. It's another thing to see you perform it, which is really an um, important aspect of it. One of the things I really like about it, um, too, is that you shift the focus from you, like what are you trying to get out of being a teacher? And you externalize it. It goes back into a broader conversation about the student, about the parent, about us. And there's a scene in there and I'm not gonna spoiler it. I'm not gonna give a spoiler. People should check it out on their own, but you reveal things to parents that they didn't know about their own kids. That's what teachers do. And so you totally turn the tables on this guy. If you did it in the cab on the way home, I, I, that's, that doesn't bother me at all um, because there's lots of other lawyers who got their comeuppance, not just lawyers, anybody who wants to question teachers. 
I, I was thinking about that in the broader context of essential workers, and even that term makes me a little uncomfortable, but it's a term of our time. And uh, sanitation workers, nurses, meatpacking, uh, people who work in agriculture, and teachers have all found themselves through this pandemic caught in this, um, in this vice where they're told, you know, society really honors your work although we don't usually compensate you much for it, and we might run you down at a, at a dinner party for how little you earn. But by the way, we also need you in the classroom by Monday, uh, or society's gonna fall apart. It's a conundrum that I think we're gonna be unpacking for a long time. Like I said, I have a lot of teachers in my family now, um, and my sister, for example, and um, it's been excruciating having to watch her go through, through that. What, what have been sort of your thoughts about this sort of essential worker debate, so-called. It shouldn't be a debate, but there it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm glad the teachers got on the list. And uh, um, I understand the you know, frustration of parents who, who uh, you know, who are sort of jumping down teachers' throats saying, you know, we, we, we need for you to do this. And I, I know that that's coming from you know, I, I need to get on with my life and I need to know that my kids are taken care of. Um, so please just shut up and take this shot and, and go back into the classroom and, and be happy with what we were paying you the first time. Um, and then you've got and then you've got unions that have sometimes, um, um, you know, capitalized on this and uh, and said, no, this this is the crisis that we need for. Uh, to, to argue for 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 higher pay, um, and uh, oh, which reminded me, um, one of the what, my what teachers make rubs some people the wrong way uh, uh, for many different reasons. But but one of them was um, uh, somebody wrote and said, Mr. Molly, I I really admire the passionate way you defend the teaching practice and make people feel good about, you know, choosing to walk the noble path that they have chosen to walk, please stop. Please stop doing that. Because the only way, this was 10 years before the pandemic, the or, or, or more, the, you know, the only way that we're going to, uh, you know, make things better for teachers is if as if society reaches a, a crisis point, and um, and maybe we're, maybe we're there, um, um, but uh, I, I've been out of the classroom, out of the regular classroom for so long that I'm I'm leery of of um, of uh, attempting to speak on on e educational policy. So, do I have the answers? No, no. Um, but we shouldn't let this crisis go to waste. But I, I'm not quite sure how to what how to make the most of it. Have you been drawn in? I can only imagine you might have a wide network around the world of teachers who see you as an advocate, um, and with a with a unique kind of platform, um, which is one where you speak directly to people as poetry as poets do. Right. Um, have you been pulled into some of those discussions over this year? heard from teachers who are friends of yours who want to channel some of that that anger i've had that right here on COVID calls teachers who they go right. off script in a sense and they really express how they're feeling which is exhausted angry uh bundle of emotions obviously yeah i have um my i've got uh i've got two little kids um who i can hear in the background i hope they don't uh, uh you i hope you don't hear them too much um, and, uh, one of my son's, um, buddies, uh, her mom is the head of the PTA at, uh, at a local school. And she got, she got drawn into it, um, because the, somebody from the teacher's union, you know, she was going to be talking to, to being a, doing a big PTA zoom call with all the parents. And like, this is, this is, these are the protocols that we're, you know, we've got in place. Um, and the union said, we, we want, we want 10 minutes on your zoom call to tell these parents, you know, don't send your kids or else, you know, you're, you're playing with people's mm -hmm. lives. And she was like, no, 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 this is the parent 
you know, the parent, I'm addressing the parents, you can't. And then, yeah. and, and it was, she was really put into, in the middle of it. And, um, and you know, everybody, everybody hated the way she dealt with it because uh, nobody, you know, she, she tried to walk a fine line in the middle and it, that was, that didn't, that didn't work for the people who wanted to continue with remote learning. And that didn't work for the people who wanted only in-person learning. I, I, I have, I have not been drawn in. Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID Calls and I'm talking to Taylor Molly today. Let's shift over to poetry. Well, we've been talking about poetry throughout, but more specifically what it's been like for you in the, in the pandemic. Um, you draw from many different inputs. You were just already describing, looking out the window, possibilities of things that might happen in the future. You're, you're obviously constantly constructing and carrying words, as you said, like loose change. And then we were locked down in our homes for months and people who've been attentive to public health have been locked a lot longer than that. Could you share a little bit about what it's been like for you to find yourself in the sort of enforced isolation and instead of being able to feed on the sights and sounds and words that are out there in the streets in New York? I suspect that there are poets who have seen this uh, mandatory isolation as a wonderful uh, break and an opportunity to retreat into themselves and mm -hmm. write uh, reflectively. I'm not one of those. Uh, this has been this has been um, a very challenging for me artistically, but I don't know that it's I don't know that it's the I can blame the pandemic entirely because we as a country are also um, you know going through a period of of of, of racial reckoning and. Um, and I, I, I'm, I, I'm the luckiest. I had the luckiest, most privileged childhood, you know, in the world. And uh, and in my in my weaker moments, I think it's it's just been very challenging for me to write the kind of poems that I always used to write, because I sound an awful lot like a privileged middle-aged white guy, which is what I am, and. And I and uh, it's not just that. I, I think I, I put my. I was writing in my in my journal the other, the other morning. Uh, keep my little leather bound journal from the Strand bookstore, and um, and I said the the worst part is not that, not that I feel the world, isn't really interested in the poetic musings of a privileged middle aged straight white guy. It's that. I'm no longer in, interested in in some of my in some of my musings, uh, the, the types of poems that I write, wrote wrote before. So I'm going through a real uh, mm. a, a drought as I wonder, like, what am I? What, shouldn't I be using this time better? To but I, I've uh, I we before we got started, we we started talking a little bit about genealogy. There's mm -hmm. a there's a Knowles in my in my family. Uh, 250 years back on Nantucket. And uh, that's why I think you and I might be cousins besides the we're fact gonna, that we- We're gonna track that. <laughs> um, so I've gone just, I, I sunk myself deep into genealogy. I have a family chart on my wall that, um, that shows over uh, 1600 people, direct ancestors. And I realized when I had it printed, it's like, that's, that's more people in my family than than anyone in my family has ever been able to look at at one time. My mm -hmm. my aunt, my sister's, uh, my my mother's older sister, she has a thick binder. Uh, you know, every every generation has at least one uh, amateur genealogist sure. who, will, who will bore everybody else at the party, um, and I'm that one from my generation. <laughs> My aunt, <laughs> and it sounds like you are, and you might be turning your voice. You're turning your voice. Guilty, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> I got it from my aunt, and I, I wear it with honor. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, so she's got binders full of people that, and you know, she probably has more people in her binder, but she's got aunts and uncles and cousins. I'm looking at direct answers, and it's it, direct ancestors. Did I say direct answers? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, that is, that applies too. I like that. Right. Right. Uh, I'm looking at over 1,600 direct answers 
um, on on one piece of paper. And so I, I got sunk deep into genealogy and <clears throat> I, I post on social media, um, you know, oh, uh, I just found another great, 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 a ninth great grandmother whose name was Experience Rust. You know, uh, um, I, and I know nothing about her. Hashtag ancestor poems, because everybody knows that I'm working on this book of ancestor poems. But in my weaker moments, I'm like, how do I, uh, does anybody really care about, mm -hmm. you know, my 1600 ancestors and uh, and the, the, the little quirky stories of them? So so this this pandemic has been, not good artistic. Also, I'm a spoken word poet and I thrive on uh, the interaction with the audience. So in one extent, it, to, to one ex to, in, in one way, the pandemic is great. And that is that I've been able to read and, and talk to people um, uh, much further afield. And I've honed my, my Zoom game and uh, I'm, I'm organizing a, a big event on uh, the last day of, uh, of uh, Poetry Month in April. I, inv I invented a game. I don't know whether they're going to talk about it. I invented a game two years ago called Metaphor Dice based on the understanding that a metaphor is just an equation between a big thing that's hard to talk about and a small thing, which is easier to talk about. And so um, you roll these dice and you come up with these metaphors. It's a way of writing poem backwards, starting with the metaphor and then realizing, wait, I think I could explore that in a, in a couple of lines. And um, ever since the pandemic, like right when the pandemic was about to hit, I had gathered a couple of friends and I was like, let's produce a live show let, where we go up on stage and we roll the dice. And, right. and I, one of my friends said, can we postpone this? Cause I think I need to figure out what I'm going to do to keep my family safe. And that was in, you know, early March of last Still year. On pause. So it's Thank taken you. me a long time, but we're going to, we're, we're doing a, um, we're doing a, 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 a live show called Metaphor Die, which is to say, and I know you, I noticed that you've used the phrase, which is to say, uh, quite a bit. Can I do that? Can I put this in the comments? I'll, I'll go ahead. Sure, and... you do that and I'll bring it up on screen. Oh, oh I, put it, I put it in the, in the private chat. Yep. Um, uh, there, that's the, uh, they, I just got the ticket link. Anybody who wants to join me on April 30th, and watch rappers and musicians and poets and comedians all respond to different, uh, to, to the same metaphors that we roll live. Join me, donation only. I, I love that. And I, I, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, was, you know, it has been interesting to see musicians and um, stand up comedians and improv. I got a chance to participate in the Philadelphia improv group, the improv theater there. They took their game up online. It was totally different from what we'd experienced before, but it was satisfying in different ways. And, and I wondered how that's, I'm sure the inquiries still come. You're doing this project with the metaphor die. Um, it must have been, it still, I guess, is a learning curve and how you adapt no, 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 to. No, no. Come here, come here. <laughs> We love visitors. This is great. Okay. Okay. We'll just say hello. <clears throat> say hello. Hello. Hi. Welcome to COVID Calls. What's your name? Michaela. Michaela. It's great to meet you. My name is Scott. Doesn't Scott look like he could be my cousin? Yeah. Yeah. Might be. Do you like make to make poetry too? Do you write poems? We like to. Uh, we sing uh, Maroon Five. Should we sing Maroon Five? In 24 hours, I need more hours with you. And we also have, we have Ulta and Larsa. The cow named Lola, the cow named Lola. Oh, I don't know the cow named Lola, but I think that's something that she's going to do. I know it. Okay. All right. Listen, you got to let Daddy finish this. Okay? Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. What a great interlude. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's the best part of the show, isn't it? It's tremendous. It is. You uh, actually, what will often happen after the live program ends is that children, animals burst in from the other rooms, and I always thought I should just keep it rolling and not tell people because we have these tremendous moments like what you just what you just shared there. Um, let me just Taylor. Let me just turn to one other thing because I want to give us time 
um, for you to read a couple of poems. And, and, and don't, I wanna, you wanna, don't you want to talk about the, the, the snatch? Yeah, that's movies? what I was just going to get to, okay. which is that um, you've gotten some, in addition to these other things you're doing, you um, got some press recently for the this quest you've been on. The Times calls it a quixotic quest. Um, I'm not sure I agree with the use of quixotic in that sense, but still, um, you've been out removing plastic bags from trees around Brooklyn and other parts of New York. And the Times, um, in the Times piece, they asked you how how good you were at this, and you said, I'm just quoting from the piece, you have a 99 cent, 99 percent success rate as long as they're within reach. And the piece goes on to describe this machine um, that you've invented to remove plastic bags from trees. And you know, anybody who lives in a city anywhere in the world knows what that looks like and the frustration of that because it's out of reach. Right. And so you've created um, a way to address that. You've gone beyond maybe rendering that into a poem and actually turned it into a, a tool. Right. Tell us a backstory and tell us uh, what you're doing with this thing and what is that you're holding anyway? Well, it, the, 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 the blue handle is, uh, it's a paint roller. You can see this is just a, a very narrow paint roller. This is where you put the roller on and the, the, the contractor would, would, would roll uh, a, a small area. And I always started with this. I had it on the end of a telescoping pole. And, uh, but at first I just, uh, I, I duct taped, because duct tape is the secret to everything. I duct tape a wire hanger, and then I cut the wire hanger and I made it a sort of a bushy, a, a bushy uh, um, sprangle of, of, of metal wire. And that turned out to be not stiff enough to, to grab the bag. So as you can see, I've got these L braces um, that I've uh, a attached. There's a small pair up here and a, and a larger pair down here. And this is Dad, big. Hurry up, it's dinner time. Here, yeah, I will be right there. I will, you guys have dinner without me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go soon. Um, anyway, this is uh, attached to the end of a, uh, my new snatchulator is, goes up to 31 feet. And uh, I pull the bag here. I now have a, a, uh, cord so my new snatchulator is in danger of separating and then i would leave this piece of metal hanging like the sword of damocles so now if that ever happens i know that i can uh pull the whole thing pull the whole thing down it started because my wife is one of those people who is just driven bonkers by plastic bags in in trees and i just want and we we, we live on the third floor and we have a massive picture window that looks out over Court Street here in, in Brooklyn. And there's a Bradford pear tree outside our window. And the Bradford pear is particularly bad. In fact, I brought a branch of the Bradford pear. It looks very much like nature's version of my snatchulator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is why bags get caught in this. And there was it was taunting us right outside our window. And so I went to Home Depot or Lowe's, I can't remember which, made my first snatch later, and ju just as another way to try to please my wife. And the, the author, Gabriel Cohen from the New York Times, I went, he, he basically logged on my Google form and said, hey, can you, uh, can you come get a bag outside my window? And uh, has the New York Times ever done a story? Because they sometimes will, sometimes I can, I can get a piece and they'll, they'll take it. So we, we, he pitched the idea to his editor and his editor got back to him within three minutes and said, that's a story I want. Perfect. And we went out two days later. Um, I got the bag out of the tree in front of his house in all of about 30 seconds. And he said, oh my God, that's I, that's been driving me crazy for two years, but it's easy if you've got the right tools. And then we went on a drive and I got a whole bunch of bags and uh, the editor um, stayed on, sat on the story until... Um, and then I knew that it was going to run on in the Times on January seventh, and oh, uh, on yeah. January sixth, when yeah. I'm watching the insurrection unfold on TV, the smallest, pettiest part of me that I am least proud of, <laughs> cried, bemoaned. But now no one's going to pay attention to me. Um, 
And uh, but I was wrong because on January seventh, people, people did. Were, people needed some good news. Anyway, they needed good right. news. Yeah, it's a great story, and and people needed good news, and it hits a lot of notes in the pandemic. People taking a lot more walks, people observing nature more. Also, the sort of broader sense of like the. I think we'll have to unpack this for a long time about the pandemic and the environment and the convergence there. People were noticing birds again and foxes in the streets and suburban neighborhoods. And here you are doing this act, which is a is right in that hits a sweet spot of that context. It was perfect when I read it. I thought, yeah, that's that's right for these times. Did, did it feel like a pandemic act to you, or just something that that just happened to coincide? No, but with I the did. Pandemic? I did for the first two months of the pandemic. My my family, we escaped, we were like many New Yorkers that, that could, we escaped the city and went up to uh, uh, Connecticut. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny, we, we, there was so much we didn't know then. Um, New York has been, has been a less safe place since then. Uh, we, came, we came back in June of last year and there have been obviously much more dangerous times here in New York than then. Um, but as uh, you know, my, I don't actually, my, it's, it's my brother and my sister who, who technically still own the house in Connecticut and they wanted to use it. And so we weren't all gonna be there together. Um, it wasn't a, I had been doing more bag snatulation during the pandemic. It's one of the things that uh, I get such joy from it and, mm -hmm. um, and people are always stopping me on the street going, wait, what, do you work for the city? And I say, are you kidding? I'm wearing a blue velvet blazer. No, I don't work for the city. You know? uh, and, and people say, wait, there's a bag in front of my house. It's right around the corner. I'm like, let's yeah. go get it, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. You do work for the city, but you don't work for the, I don't know how to put, I don't know how to say it. You would know how the best way to say it, but you do work. You do work I do for work the for the city. They just don't know it. They don't know it. Exactly. Yeah. Nor do they. Nor do they pay me for it. Now, you told me just before we went on that we might have a opportunity here in this hour to hear some new work from you, and in fact, it seems like it's a commissioned work. It uh, is. Kind of. Would you mind sharing it? Yeah, I'm going to be speaking uh, in a couple of weeks to uh, the first grade at a local uh, at a local school as they begin their unit on trash and inventions. And uh, the, they know that I'm a poet. And so the teacher there said, I wonder if Taylor has a poem about the invention of the snatchulator that I could read to the students so that they're prepared for when you come in. And it's gonna be a Zoom, it's gonna be a Zoom class. So I'm gonna be doing a lot of what I just did to you, showing them the snatchulator. But now they will know this poem when the teacher gives it to them, which she has not yet. And so your audience is going to be the first one to hear this poem I wrote uh, called The Invention of the Snatchulator. Rhyming couplets, my father would be proud. Uh, here we go, the rhyme, the invention of the snatchulator. Keep in mind, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm reading to a first grade audience. A plastic bag stuck in the branches of a tree causes different strong feelings inside of me. I get mad, I get sad, and I cry real tears because I know that that bag will be stuck there for years unless someone does something to remove it from the tree. But the more I thought about it, I thought, why not me? I could clean up the trees. That was my intention. All I needed to do was invent an invention something awesome and effective that the world had never seen that could snag a bag and leave the tree clean. Let's see, a blowtorch would be dangerous and might cause the tree harm, but what about a robot with super long arms? Or wait, I just thought of the most amazing thing, like a magic floating bubble car with butterfly wings and bells and whistles and electronic lasers and a nuclear unicorn infinity phaser. It's okay to think small. It just needs to work. That's all. If there's a bag way up high and I want to catch it, all I need is a long pole <clears throat> and something to snatch it. Some pieces of metal 
sticking out at all angles. So when I twist it round a plastic bag, it tangles and I can gently pull the tangled bag free from the beautiful leafless and now grateful tree we could talk about enjambment, but we I won't get to with the first grade. That's all I need, a couple of things, nothing more, all stuff I could get at the hardware store. That's how I invented my Snatchulator, and it's pretty great, but you know what's even greater? Deciding that I could be the one to do it. After that, anything's possible. There's nothing to it. That is the invention of the Snatchulator by me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for reading that. I'm honored we got that sneak preview. I know they're going to love it. And uh, I can't wait to show this, this for my kids to watch this. Oh, and good. How old, my, are you? How old are your kids? Well, nine and 12. And um, they're like, oftentimes they're running like the Atelier Knowles because they they are inspired by poetry or anything they see in the world and they start building things. The nine-year-old is particularly interested in building paper models of things. And uh, I guarantee you when he builds his paper snatchulator, I will uh, send you a photograph of that so that you can vibe on that a little bit. Uh, did you he know loved that, that. Did you know that I just introduced paper metaphor dice? No. Tell yeah. us about that. Paper metaphor dice started as a paper product. I was teaching a class at a poetry at, at a school on the west side of Manhattan, and uh, I had the kids pick um, words words from uh, three different, you know, an abstract noun, an adject adjective, and an object. And then you put them together and you get a metaphor. And uh, I spent a long time, the whole class period, explaining what the difference between an abstract noun and a concrete noun is. And uh, there was this one girl who wasn't in, she just didn't seem like she was engaged. And I said, no, you, why, why, why aren't you engaged? And she said, because I'm, I'm really more of a scientist, a mathematician. And I said, well, that's okay, because a metaphor is an equation between a big thing and a small thing with maybe an adjective thrown in as a variable. And I saw when I started using that mathematical language that her eyes perked up. And so I got her to choose uh, three words and she chose my father broken mirror. And I said, okay, so if you were to say my father is a broken mirror, that's a metaphor. Nobody would ever think that you meant that literally. That's figurative. And now your job in the poem is to just write a couple of lines that sort of explain why your father is a broken mirror. And she said, wait, I can do that. I said, okay, I'll come back in five minutes. Use the phrase, which is to say. And I came back and she had written something like this. My father is a broken mirror, which is to say, he's been shattered into a thousand pieces so that he's hard to hold without cutting yourself. My mother says he is seven years of bad luck but even in the smallest shards, I can still recognize my own reflection. And I left Whoa. that moment, wow. that class, and I thought, there's gotta be a way that I can um, get more students to that moment quicker than having to write all those things on the, mm -hmm. on the board. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got the idea for, for metaphor dice. They're available on Amazon, or could you put metaphordice.com? Uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, but I had always missed the oppor missed the <clears throat> I had to choose my own words on the acrylic dice so that you can just take them out of the box and you roll and it's 24 times 24 times 24 which is 13,800 and something um, different unique metaphors that come from the box but you don't get to write your own um, but just last month, I came up with this uh, paper metaphor dice and they're die cut. So you can, they, they easily come out. And then I, your son is going to love this. Uh, and I'll send them even to Korea. I just ripped one, but it's fine. You can fold them and they, they're reversible and you can create your own. Uh, you put your own words on and you can put your own words on the, on the other side. Anyway, I was going to say third in the, Pandemic, 13,000 combinations could be possible for some people, um, but now that you can write your own, it's, it's, it's limitless. That's tremendous. Um, just a reminder, people can check that out at metaphordice.com, which is one of Taylor Molly's many projects that you have going. I wanna, um, we just have a couple of minutes. 
left. And I know that you're due at the dinner table, as we found out a few minutes ago. Um, and just a reminder to folks, you're listening to COVID calls. I'm talking to poet and educator Taylor Molly today. We, um, you'd mentioned maybe you've been doing some work that's touched more directly on the pandemic, um, that you had a piece that you thought maybe you could share with us. It seems like a great way to conclude our conversation today. I wonder if that would be okay with you. Okay, it's much darker as you can imagine. Um, I have a friend who, uh, my, my former mother-in-law um, died in September, not of COVID. Um, she had wonderful care, um, but uh, for the last year, her language completely left her. Uh, as, as I would imagine, it would be hard to speak through a ventilator. Um, but this is about anybody who's lost a, a, a parent who has seen their parent disappear, disappear on the, you know, from the long goodbye, uh, knows that they, they lose their language. And often, um, often the last thing they can do is just answer every question with yes. Um, or no, uh, which is worse, I believe, just to sort of, anyway, this poem is about that. It's called, <clears throat> When the Answer to Every Question is Yes. Too often comes a time when those we love have lived past the power to answer more than yes or no in response to any question. And so we simply change the questions from how are you feeling today to would you like a little more water? And if we forget and accidentally ask something more complicated, like where does it hurt today? They may look at us and smile and say yes or no to remind us that that's all they can manage or else by then everything hurts always. And even beyond this time, there is another when half of what little they have is taken to, and the answer to every question must be yes, as in, do you know how much I love you? Would you like me to read you another poem? Or shall I come visit you again soon? Or, as it is for some, and this is somehow worse for me, the answer must always be no, for they remember only how to refuse and deny, which seems the greater curse. Even so, the questions can change again to become, for example, are you done for this with this water? And aren't you tired of me reading you all these poems? No? Well, then I guess I could stay for another hour. And lastly comes the time when there are no answers, only listening and the holding of hands, which is a part of prayer. And lastly, only breathing, only air. Thank you, thank you. It's all about adapting, you know? That poem is really just about adapting. I went, when I went to see this old friend of mine for the last time, her home health aide said, you know, oh, you're gonna have a tough time talking to her because all she can do is say yes. And I said, that's not, that's not, that's not so hard. I'll just answer, I'll ask her questions and the an yes will be the only answer that, that she needs. Thank you. Thanks for, for sharing that. No, what? that's, yeah, that's, um, I think that'll resonate. It resonates with a lot of people. We're um, yeah, we trying to find, like that. you know, I mean, I think it's, this is, part of this pandemic experience is uh, everybody's always coping with death in their life in one way or another, um, but not usually is everybody coping with it all at the same time. Right. And that's what these times have been like, not only in the US, but large chunks of the world. And that making sense of, as you said at the beginning, trying to talk to people who can't talk, which we'd associate with dementia or, or Alzheimer's, has been the case for people communicating with with young people, people my age who are on it, you know, some sort of breathing apparatus or um, have to have a nurse as an interlocutor. 
that piece really speaks to that, speaks to me in that regard. Yeah. You're, you're reminding me that uh, uh, really the last conversation that I had with my dad, who died um, 32 years ago, um, um, was uh, he, he had a, either a ventilator or something in his mouth, and he needed to communicate something. He, he died of acute leukemia and was gone in five weeks. Um, but uh, so he had enough time, he, you know, he had, he had a will ready, but he, he, when he realized, oh, I'm not going to make it, um, there were some last minute changes he needed to make to his will and uh, he needed to communicate some things to us. And uh, so I remember uh, writing out on a piece of paper, the alphabet, mm-hmm. and I did it in three lines. And I, but I, sh- what I should have done was mimicked, uh, the right type that. keyboard keyboard and keyboard. i remember him in his chemo haze like searching for the letters because it was three le- you know it was not written the way he was used to it and i remember him saying um you know the the lawyer he want you know we we're going to change lawyers at the last minute he said the lawyer will act and he was pointing like a Ouija board, pointing to mm. the word. Mm. He said, P I O U. And like P I O U. There's yeah. no word that has P I O oh, pious. Mm. Pious. The lawyer will act pious, but he's fired. Anyway, sorry. That's, <laughs> I went from a, a dark moment to an even darker memory, but. That's, these are the times we live in, right? These, these are. And I'm sorry about your dad, and I, and thank you for sharing that that memory. My um, my grandfather, when he was dying, I was extremely close to him. All of my grandfathers, but my mother's father, he at the very end would just he was just repeating the things you would say to him. And I've thought about that a lot over the years, and the sort of last conversation with him, which was you know I, I love you, I miss you, and he would just repeat it back. And it's it's a version of what you're you know when the answer is yes, and I had that I had never put this together to what you just said, but it's like I think you know you I said to him then the things I wanted to hear back, right? Yeah, and and it's yeah. a time of communication which in which words are sparse but meaning is is great, and, and that's what poetry is too I think. Mm. Mm. So, um, I, I well. We've covered a lot of ground, Taylor. Uh, it's been an honor to speak with you today and share this time and to have you read two poems and a visit from a daughter. Uh, I couldn't have asked for, for more in a particularly heavy week with the Fukushima Memorial this week. And um, thanks for everything you're doing. And my, um, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I, I, I think it's amazing. You must be coming up on your one year anniversary. And I know you started with p- epidemiologists and doctors and disaster experts like yourself, and now you're scraping the bottom of the barrel and getting <laughs> poets and snatulators and uh, game inventors on, but I, it's been an honor to speak with you for this past hour. I want to remind everybody that you've been listening to COVID Calls, and you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m., and we'll have a whole new group of guests to talk to next week, so take care of yourself, and we'll see you 5 o'clock. Taylor, thanks again. My pleasure. Bye.